I think we are recording. Yes, yeah. We are live. We are live. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, at least for the two of us. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, here we go. Mm -hmm. So today I'm talking with Professor Pedram Khalili. He's a professor of electrical engineering at the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern University. How are you doing today, Professor? You're doing well. Thank you, Idris. Uh, well, pleasure talking with you. Sounds good. Actually, the pleasure is all mine. Now, usually I have this uh, conversation usually in person, but um, if you're listening to this podcast sometime in the future, we're dealing with a pandemic right now, so <laughs> we're practicing social distancing so we can't be in person, but I think this is still going to be an awesome podcast with the professor. I, right, sure agree? I, will. <laughs> I look forward to it. All right, awesome. So, um, Professor, can you give us a short summary of your journey in science? So I'm, I'm interested to hear you know, what sparked this interest in the field you're in today that got you maybe from your undergrad days to where you're at today in your position at such a prestigious uh, institution? Hmm. Yeah, I guess I was uh, kind of interested in science from, uh, you know, from my childhood and that was probably sparked uh, to, to a great extent by, by my family. But then specifically uh, when I was, uh, when I, um, started uh, my studies at the university, I decided to study electrical engineering. I was always kind of good and enjoyed uh, math and physics, but then I uh, did not really want to go in a direction where I would only do fundamental studies. I also wanted to kind of do something quote-unquote useful. <laughs> at least that was the advice that uh, uh, students uh, back then were given by... I think know, it's the same right now, too. I think it's the same right now with uh, theoretical physics. It's it so could be, yeah, yeah. So that's not to say that fundamental physics and math are not useful. So yeah. I always wonder uh, if, uh, you know, what would have happened if I had gone in a different direction. But but I'm happy with the way it's been. Awesome. And I'm happy, too, because, um, you know, I had the chance to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, yeah. <laughs> so um, actually, to stay on that, situation right because um, I'm part of your lab full disclosure I'm actually under the professor's lab so this is going to be a easy you know interview for him I'm going to throw him a few softballs all right <laughs> so um, I do machine learning research at Pearl Lab all right which is the physical electronics lab at Northwestern under Professor Khalili so uh, we develop computer storage devices using nanoscale technology right so the whole goal is to enable better performance and efficiency, yeah? So um, basically, it's a new computational paradigm, right? So is that a good summary of what we do at Pearl, Pearl Lab, uh, Professor? Yeah, pretty much. I think, uh, you know, if you think about machine learning or more generally about AI, um, we see kind of all of the exciting ways that it's being used today and we, we can all imagine uh, things that we could potentially still do with AI if it was more accurate, faster, more energy efficient and so on. Mm. And I'd like to kind of highlight the energy efficiency aspect mm -hmm. because this is something that is not talked about a lot, at least in the popular media, but it's really important. Um, so uh, if you, I mean, a few years back, there was this um, uh, story about uh, Google's AI um, uh, basically beating the master of the game Go. Yes. Uh, at that game, right? And of course, that was very impressive. Uh, but then if you compare the power consumption of a human brain to that of Google's machine, which was built of I forget how many thousand TPUs, tensor processing units, uh, it's orders of magnitude uh, different. Uh, and so, and that's not scalable. Uh, so you, if you really want to build better AI, it has to be more energy efficient. And so in, in basically my research lab, the question we're asking is, can we do things fundamentally differently, not just incrementally differently, but fundamentally differently? Uh, can we think about new architectures? And particularly, can we build new types of hardware that allow us to build new kinds of architectures that can bridge that orders of magnitude gap? All right, interesting. So um, currently computers are actually using the John von Neumann architecture, right? So right. Uh, we can envision the memory hierarchy 
as having um, computer registers at the top. Mm -hmm. Then below that, we've got cache memory, which would be um, SRAM. So that's the static random access memory. Now under that, we have main memory, which a lot of people know as RAM, random access mm -hmm. memory. And under RAM, we have our secondary memory. So the local disk, right? right? And it so happens that on every rung, the previous memory, I guess, device would be a cache for the one below. So a register would be a cache for SRAM, SRAM would be, and so on and so on, right? So uh, we're looking to we're looking to change that, or at least improve on that, right? So we're trying to combine how logic and memory could be integrated. Mm -hmm. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. So. Uh, the hierarchy that you just described, and that's exactly how we build computers today, is, is governed, of course, this was based on the ideas of Turing and von Neumann. And, and the specific technologies that we use to build those different layers of memory essentially uh, are chosen based on a set of trade-offs. And, and the most important trade-off is um, how fast is the memory and how cheap is it? So if I can build, if, I mean, of course, we would always like to have very fast memory, right? As much fast memory as possible, but fast memory is expensive. So we can't use too much of it. And so basically that's why we have these different tiers of memory, which successively become slower and cheaper. And so we have more of them. That's why we have terabytes of disk space but we don't have terabytes of SRAM. It would just be too expensive. Um, but yes, so if you then think about um, how a brain is organized, and I have to say, of course, we don't really understand how the brain exactly does what it does, but what we can kind of tell is that it's really not organized the way that we build computers today. And, there is a much tighter integration between memory and computing, both in terms of the hardware and in terms of function. So it's not really doing computing the way that we necessarily do in, in today's computers. And so, um, so it's, I think it's an interesting question, you know, how close can we get to that and what kinds of hardware do we need for that? All right. So while we're on the topic of hardware, uh, there's a, technology called spintronics, right? So spin transfer electronics. So can we um, kind of dwell on that a bit? Mm -hmm. So um, what is spintronics? And I think we we're getting this idea from the idea of spin, all right? The spin of an electron, which would uh, be the intrinsic angular momentum of an electron, right? So right. so what is that exactly? So for the layman, what, what are we talking about when we say spintronics? Sure. Sure. Yeah, so I think uh, if you think about an electron, which is basically this fundamental charge, a fundamental particle, so atoms are built of uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yeah. Electrons have charge. We all are familiar with that. Uh, but we are probably less familiar in everyday life with the spin of the electron. So it has two properties, mainly, if you're interested in the charge and the spin. Okay, what is the spin? It's called spin because it's, you can kind of think about it as if you think of, about the electron as a little bowl, mm -hmm. if you have that electron kind of spinning around its axis, that creates angular momentum, just like a ball or a wheel, right? Um, that's not exactly the right way of thinking about it because an electron is not governed by the same physics as a macroscopic object like a ball is, but mm -hmm you can kind of get the idea. Mm -hmm. But where we all interact with electron spin every day is probably uh, permanent magnets. If you have a fridge magnet, um, the reason that it sticks to, uh, a, uh, uh, to your fridge mm -hmm. is that basically all or most of the spins of the electrons in that material are pointing in the same direction. There are certain materials where that spontaneously happens. So that is kind of the macroscopic uh, uh, familiarity, I guess, that most people have. With uh, all right, so that's interesting. So for us to have a magnet, the spin of the electrons of this material actually has to point, it has to point in the same direction, basically, right? Right, right. So in other words, the angular momentum or yeah which is basically proportional to the spin it has to point uh in the same direction now of course not for all of the 
uh, electrons necessarily, but uh, there has to be a net alignment uh, that, that gives rise to the north and south poles that we have. Actually, while we're on, on the topic of spin, actually, um, a few weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast, right? And this actually has nothing to do with physics or science. It's actually an American um, history podcast. And the episode was about the the war, the Second World War, right? And there was a gentleman named Samuel Gouchsmith, right? So he was the one that serendipitously found or discovered electron spin, right? Yeah. Now, what's okay. interesting is, so he was part of the Alsace mission. Now, now the Alsace mission was under the Manhattan Project, right? Okay. And okay. Uh, they were tasked, so the Alsace mission was tasked with capturing a few German scientists, right? So Werner Heisenberg and the other scientists under, um, I think they called it the Uranium Club. So this was just a group of physicists that were trying to get Germany the bomb before everyone else, right? right. So what I found funny was, um, so before the war, he was a professor. So he's a Dutch American, I guess. Wow. Now before the war, he was a professor at Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. But after the war, he became a professor at Northwestern University. So you're following in his footsteps, right? That's very interesting. <laughs> and actually, Idris, I did not know that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm learning something as we speak. So yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's really interesting, though. Yeah. So now, um, so I guess we can think of memory as a contiguous 2D arrays, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, what spintronics does is basically gives us this third dimension, right? So with things called uh, racetracks, what are those, by the way? It sounds, I mean, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, um, yeah. So I guess uh, let me let me take one step back and tell you what spintronics is in my view, kind of my definition of it. So if you if you go back to that bridge magnet, because that's that's what I guess most most of us are very familiar with. Uh, well, you you know that it kind of you know if you if you could uh, uh, if you if you uh, think about the north and south poles of a permanent magnet, they don't change usually, right? Mm -hmm. And this is this is true for large magnets. Mm -hmm. Turns out, if you make small small enough magnets, those poles can be switched um, fairly easily, and and you can do that with a magnetic field. So if you have a large magnet, it mm -hmm. can flip the direction of a smaller magnet, and that is. That is why if you have a magnetic medium uh, and a strong permanent magnet, the two will stick together because the stronger magnet will make the smaller magnet kind of align with it. Interesting. This is not spintronics. This has been known for ages already, uh, and people, people kind of knew how magnets behave. What's interesting about spintronics is it's all about ways other than magnetic fields to control magnetism. So can you, for instance, take a piece of magnetic material that has to be engineered in a very particular way, of course, apply a voltage or electric potential difference across it and make its mag magnetic properties change? Or can you pass an electric current through it and change its magnetic properties, not because of the magnetic field, but because of other more fundamental effects that, that occur inside the material. That is basically spintronics. It's, uh, and spintronics really stands for spin transport electronics. So it's basically the interaction between electrons charge and electron spin at a very fundamental level. That can enable all kinds of technologies. And um, the technology that uh, um, Again, is being used has been being has has been used for decades already. Is magnetic sensors that are used in every hard disk drive. So, so you know, if you think about spintronics, it's not this kind of um, uh, shouldn't be this very unfamiliar term that we think of as something futuristic. Uh, even we've been using it for decades. Every time you uh, click something on the internet, um, you are basically retrieving data somewhere from a data center, which is stored on a hard disk drive. Mm -hmm. Just to, to read out from a hard disk drive, there is a magnetic field sensor that does that. And that's the spintronic device, uh, just to give you an example. But yes, 
you can build all kinds of magnetic memories, um, and the generic term for that is MRAM, magnetic random access memories, uh, that have some sort of advantage if you compare it to that hierarchy that we were talking about earlier. Sure. And, uh, and uh, racetrack memories are an example of that. So they are not exactly random access, but they, are, uh, they have been proposed um, as essentially a, a better way of building data storage mm -hmm. uh, compared to a hard disk drive. So if you're interested, and if we want to talk a little bit more about racetrack memories, Basically, um, what a hard disk drive does is it's, it's a magnetic medium. It's literally a disk, right, covered with a magnetic layer, magnetic material that's extremely thin. And you can think of it as basically having a very large number of tiny magnets on it, right? So the direction of the spins in these tiny magnets can point usually in two different directions along an axis, so up or down or right or left. Um, and that's basically how we store the data, right? So you have um, terabytes of data on a hard disk because you have terabytes of these tiny magnets. Interesting. To, to read out or to write into any of these elements, what we do right now in hard disks is we literally rot rotate the disk. So we have a so-called recording head, which does the writing and reading, which is where the sensor sits that I was talking about. Okay. It's fixed in space, and the disk kind of rotates underneath at a you know, pretty fast speed. Fast for mechanical device, but uh, compared to what we could do electrically, that's not very fast. And so the idea of, um, of racetrack memories is to create kind of something analogous to that in a solid state device. And instead of having those bits uh, rotate mechanically, we could have them rotate or move along a so-called racetrack using electric currents, and that's faster. Um, so that has been the idea, and it is something that was proposed probably around, uh, I think, 20 or so years ago and has been in development since then. And that's one of the kind of um, spintronic device ideas that, uh, that, uh, that you hear a lot about. And it's, it's an active area of research, yeah. Sounds good. So yeah, you were saying about 20 or so years ago. So what, in the 90s, that's when uh, we realized that um, the electrons in a hard, the hard drive, right, enables better read heads, right? So therefore we're unlocking more and more um, storage because of that, right? Right, so basically if you, again, if you think about the hard drive that I just described, there's two, two parts to the question of how much data can I store in this, right? So, and of course we always want to have more data, right? Um, the first part of the question is how small can I make these bits? The yeah. second one is how accurately can I read out a particular bit of information that I'm interested in, right? And these are two separate questions. I could make them very small, but if I can't distinguish between two bits that are sitting next to each other, it's no use. And so um, the development of better magnetic field sensors was very important for this continuous development of hard disk drives. And uh, this really occurred through a series of innovations and fundamental discoveries in spintronics where essentially all of it can be boiled down to making a device where the electrical resistance is sensitive to a magnetic field. And if that sensitivity is large, the larger that sensitivity is, the more accurately I can measure an elect uh, a magnetic field and the better I can localize uh, the, uh, the, the particular bit that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, in the old, in the 80s, uh, we were using basically 19th century physics effectively to build these sensors. So classical physics, right? Essentially classical or, or 
semi-classical physics, um, an effect called anisotropic magnetoresistance. resistance. That's basically sort of the technical term for it. So magneto resistance, that's when we have two magnets and we have a thin layer of uh, resistant. Uh, that came next. So magneto resistance generally means a resistance that depends on the magnetic field. That's basically whatever the mechanism, right? Um, but the effect that you were alluding to um, that was discovered in the late 80s um, was... I was born phenomenal. in the 80s, so right. you know, I'm, I'm an 80s. Thank you, actually. So there was this effect called, which at the time was called giant magnetic resistance, uh, for obvious reasons. It was a pretty large effect. Uh, where, where, you know, if you, you had basically two magnetic layers separated by a non-magnetic layer. And what uh, two groups in, in France and Germany basically in parallel but independently discovered was that in such structures you could have a very um, um, a resistance that is very sensitive to a magnetic field. And that enabled the sort of the um, continued scaling down of hard disk um, uh, size or scaling up of capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was also recognized by a Nobel Prize in physics, actually, in 2007. Uh, so, so it was, and that was, you could argue that that was really the most, the fundamental discovery that started the field of spintronics. Wow, wow. So um, let's touch more on uh, magnetoelectric uh, random access memory, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so we're basically performing computations uh, as well as uh, having memory, right? So as a result, we're retaining the state even after power is turned off, right? Right, right, right. So, um, yeah. So, and and this is this is what you just described is one of the key ideas in spin um, So, if you think about, so we, you know, we, we talked about electrons having charge and spin, right? So, well, that's true. Um, the point is, if we only use the charge of the electron to do computing. Ah. Charge is something that can leak, yes. right? So you have charge somewhere stored on a conductor. If you go back and measure it some time later, usually there are many mechanisms in a circuit, in a lot of electronic circuits, where the charge can basically escape. So if you store information using charge, uh, chances are that it's it's going to be gone afterwards. And usually what you need to do is you need to keep a certain voltage applied to your circuit, to your chip, sure. in order to not lose the information. And this is true even when your chip is not doing anything useful, right? So if your computer is computing something, it's done, it stores the, the, that information somewhere, you still need the voltage to be there. When, once you turn it off, um, basically, the information is gone. This is why we need a certain amount of time for a computer to boot up or to shut down, because we need to move these data to a non-volatile storage medium that does not need voltage uh, so that we can turn off the computer and not lose data. Now, with spintronics, when you use spins, just like the Frit magnets that we talked about, you have north and south poles. Once you program that into a bit, it's very stable. It stays there for years. Wow. And so you basically have a computer that while it's doing, while it's computing something, it remembers what it does. It doesn't forget about it. And mm -hmm. so this whole shutting down, you know, boot up time kind of disappears. And more importantly, energy dissipation reduces because you don't need to apply the voltage all the time to your chip. You only apply it when it's doing something useful. And so it, 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 it's much less power needed because of that. Wow. So if I was to summarize that, so MRAM, so as opposed to having electricity and not having electricity represent zeros and ones, so bits. So mm -hmm. we're looking at a phase right? So maybe a peak of a phase can represent a zero and a valley can represent one or vice versa, right? Well, yeah, but no more simply, um, you, you, you basically, we talked about all of the electron spins or, 
know, many electron spins in the material pointing one direction or the other in a make heavy material. Sure. That's your zero and one, right? So if, mm -hmm. if you're point, all pointing up versus all pointing down, mm -hmm. uh, that's two states of, uh, of your memory, which you can then read out, you can interact with electrically because the resistance of your device will depend on that direction. Oh, so I'm hearing a lot of advantages here. So instantaneous uh, booting, right? Mm -hmm. We never lose information, even when we have like a power surge or right. radiation, right? And um, better battery life, no? Sure, sure. Yes, yeah, better battery life. Uh, and uh, security of data is very important. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's improved, yes. Mm -hmm. And we're able to do more compute intensive operations, right, on these devices. So kind of like machine learning that we're doing or image recognition. This exactly, exactly. So if you think about, well, power dissipation, I mean, the example I gave earlier, which is, uh, you know, if you compare the power dissipation of a human brain to an AI chip, uh, it's orders of magnitude different. And if we can save a significant amount of the energy that we are using to, to do computing in those chips today uh, and still perform the same functionality just as, just as fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and that allows us to really scale up these systems because we can afford to do that in terms of energy. And so our AI becomes a lot smarter as a result. Okay, sounds good. So our silicon compatible anti ferron magnets is this the new this is the new frontier in this technology right 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 yeah, so, touch on that a bit sure sure um so all of these magnetic materials that we talked about so far are based on uh are essentially a class of materials that um, we call ferromagnets and ferromagnet means magnetic like iron, right? So yeah. iron is the prototypical ferromagnet. That's right. There are materials where those electron spins are arranged differently. Uh, these are called antiferromagnets. And they're called antiferromagnets because if you look at any two electron spins in this material, any two neighboring spins, they point in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have basically this alternating lattice of spins that point up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on, right? So if you take a look from a distance at this material, you would think it's not even magnetic. There is no north and south pole there, right? So, but if you look microscopically, there is magnetic order. The spins are aligned, but they're aligned anti parallel to each other. Now, why is that interesting? Why would I even be interested in such, such a material? Sure. The reason is that materials like this do not interact with magnetic fields. You could apply a very large magnetic field. You could take a permanent magnet, put it next to this material, and literally it will do nothing. Right. This is important because when you use magnetic materials, ferromagnetic materials to store information, you can destroy the data or you can tamper with the data using a magnetic field. And so that's uh, a, an important design consideration, a very big problem that people need to worry about. They have still been able to build products, so it's a solvable problem, but it's a problem that gets more difficult. Is that why when we put a magnet next to our credit cards, it could actually destroy it? Basically, yes, yes. So our credit cards use a magnetic yeah. stripe to yeah. store information. You can mm -hmm. do that, yeah. Similarly, in a hard disk, uh, you need much larger magnetic fields, right? Yeah. But you can still erase the information in the hard disk using, uh, using, uh, using a large enough magnetic field. Oh, yeah. Uh, to give I you know. an example, yeah, go ahead. I know that because uh, my brother, his, uh, his friend's computer, he actually destroyed the hard drive because he uh, had these very, their small magnets was very strong right. and it actually destroyed his hard drive. It was, yeah, yeah. So large enough magnets can, can do that. And uh, uh, I think for, for some of the audience, uh, maybe who are breaking that path like I am, there was an episode where they actually do that to a computer, right? So... <laughs> Uh, so that's, uh, but, but with antiferromagnets, because you don't have this macroscopic magnetization, sure. for it, 
you you basically have a much more secure uh, uh, storage of data. Now, for ages, for decades, literally, it was thought that you could not manipulate the uh, spins in an antiferromagnet at all. Basically, there is no electrical way to do it. And so people thought it's useless. Uh, in fact, um, the physicist Louis Nail, who got his no Nobel Prize for his work on antiferromagnets, is famous to have said in his Nobel lecture that these are interesting materials, but probably useless. Wow. And, and, uh, but in recent years, actually, people figured out in spectronics that there are very fundamental ways that you can actually have electric current interact with that microscopic order, and you can switch antiferromagnetic order. Um, and, uh, and so you could potentially build devices that are, uh, that are resilient to external fields, sure. uh, but otherwise work just like any other uh, electronic memory. All right. So it's interesting because the first time I heard about antiferromagnets was when I was looking up the, the Zhilizhinsky Moria exchange mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. one would do in a you know pandemic lockdown, right? You know? <laughs> 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 but but um, so this uh, describes um, the magnetic moment as not parallel as in the case of a ferron magnet, nor anti-parallel as in the case of an anti-ferron magnet, but perpendicular, right? right? Right. So that would be what it is, right? So, um, yeah, like you said, this technology initially wasn't, you know, seen to be applicable for anything, right? By Louis Nell. Mm -hmm. right? So that brings us to the Nell vector, right? Mm -hmm. So what, this is the difference between the magnetic moment, right? And this actually has, this is basically the whole enchilada when it comes to this technology, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? So, exactly. so um, yeah, go, if you can describe that, the nail vector. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. So uh, one way to describe it is, uh, let's, let's, let's kind of take this analogy of a permanent magnet one step further, right? So if you, um, you know, if you think about the structure of the antiferromagnet that we just described, you know, you have, you can think of it as a bunch of tiny little magnets with north and south poles that are alternating. So every two neighbors have north and south poles that are opposite, right? So you have south, north, and north, south, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the interesting, the important ingredient is that these basically switch in lockstep. So if you switch one of them from say south, north to north, south, the other one will switch from north south to south north, right? So, so basically, uh, uh, you, they they switch from up down down up to you know, the opposite in both in both directions. Now, you can define a direction that is basically the relative direction of these two neighbors. Uh, and that is what is called the nail vector. So it's in, in, in mathematical terms, it's basically the vector subtraction of the two magnetizations that we call the nail vector after Louis nail, basically. Yeah. So basically, you can store information in the direction of the nail vector, right. and we retrieve that by detecting the resistance, right? Exactly, yes, yeah. So just like in the case of ferromagnets, there are multiple effects, uh, physical effects, physical mechanisms that make the electrical resistance of uh, materials or samples that you can build based on antiferromagnets sensitive to the nail vector. And so you can basically use those to read out where your nail vector is pointing. Right. So, yeah, this is all very interesting stuff, right? So what sort of um, hindrances do you think uh, we're facing or do you know that we're facing at this time to get this going? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, Spintronics and MRAM in general, magnetic random access memories, uh, have been in development for really more than two decades. So it's a, it's a long time. Yes. And... Um, let me tell you why people are interested in it today and then why it's been so hard. That's at least my perspective on why, why it's been so hard to do this. 
The reason people are interested relates to our discussion of AI and more generally the fact that we are dealing with larger and larger amounts of data. It's becoming more and more difficult to process those. And unlike maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, where if you bought a computer, the only thing you really look at was how fast the processor is, right? Remember how many megahertz, megahertz, gigahertz, right? That was the number you cared about. Nowadays, you don't hear about that anymore, right? All you think about is how much memory do I have? How much memory? Yeah. Yeah. And this is a reflection of the fact that the way we compute has changed. Uh, we are dealing with large amounts of data. It doesn't matter how fast you can process one bit. It matters how much data you can make available to that processor at a given time. So this is why there is interest in new kinds of memory generally. And magnetic memories are very interesting because they are fast. They're inherently fast. And so you can hope to build useful stuff with them. That's one aspect. The other one is there is no standby power dissipation as we just talked about. So you have instant on off. And that's very interesting for any kind of low power system and IoT system, wearable systems, batteries of sensors and so on. These are all examples where you don't have a battery or you have a very small battery in the system and power is really at a premium. And so you, if having a memory that does not consume a lot of power, uh, that you can turn off and remembers what it was doing, that's very, very useful. Now, why has it been difficult? So to, there are good reasons to develop this technology. Well, um, that's really, that has to do with the economical aspects of it. So, um, you know, the, um, the, the cost, to introduce any new technology, any new kind of solid state device into the semiconductor industry in a major way so that it's mass produced and it's eventually cheap enough that everybody can use it, the cost to develop it is enormous. And so the amount of investment that was required to build these things was very large. And so naturally, major manufacturers for a long time were hesitant. So they, they really needed to see both the demand from the end customers, that they really needed a new memory technology, that they would use it today if they had it. And then also on the technical side, they needed it to be de-risked sufficiently so that they saw, well, you know, if we now put in enough, enough money into this three, four, five years from now, we will be able to put this in product. It took more than 20 years for that to happen, but it has happened. So now, um, you know, the past year, couple of years or so, there were uh, basically announcements from all of the major semiconductor manufacturers that they have MRAM either in production or pretty close to production. And, uh, and this was driven Again, very largely by IoT and AI. Those are those are the main main driving forces behind it. Uh, but if you think about it, um, you know, the last time that the new memory technology, fundamentally new memory technology, was introduced was in the 90s, uh, and that was flash back then. So it's really it really uh, re requires an enormous amount of investment. And that means a long time uh, to make these things happen. Interesting. So do you think in the interim, so this is very interesting, right? Because uh, I've always argued about this idea of fundamental and applied research, right? So yeah. it goes back to the, you know, the argument of funding from the government and funding from, you know, pri the private sector, right? Because in the interim, I'd say it was academia that was doing research in this field, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and in fact, and this is very important, uh, a lot of the academic research that ended up being used in products now and major manufacturers are putting it into use now, yes. was really not done necessarily with that end product in mind. I mean, 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago, who could have anticipated what the product even looks like, right? So that really points to the importance of fundamental research 
perspective yeah. because it can be applied potentially in ways that we don't anticipate. Mm -hmm. But it, there's also, of course, it also points to the importance of doing applied research also in, the, in, in academic environments because that did a lot to de-risk the technology so that it, it got to a point where companies were able to take it over. Otherwise, it might have stayed you know, and a few interesting academic papers, but then uh, if people had given up on it and if there hadn't been funding from the government to kind of uh, bridge that gap, it would never have gotten to a point where industry could, could actually take it over. So in short, we do need fundamental research to be the impetus for applied research at the end of the day, right? Absolutely, yes, yeah. And of course, not all fundamental research ends up being applied, but you can't necessarily anticipate that beforehand, before you do it. So, yeah. Yeah, this is awesome, because I'd say we've gone through a lot, and I like the fact that we can kind of wrap it up with this, because mm -hmm. it touches on, you know, the politics of science <laughs> and funding, and the fact that we still have some loose ends that maybe you know, prospective undergrads, grads, and postdocs that want to join your lab, right, yes. to actually tackle, right? So that's, that's another thing. If there's anyone listening to this that they find this fascinating like we do, right, mm -hmm. but then we're biased, you know. But, <laughs> so how can they get a hold of you? Are you accepting researchers at this time? I'm always looking for, for researchers, and I always love to talk about this stuff. So if you find this interesting, just send me an email, uh, and I'm always happy to talk. So yeah, this is a very fast-evolving field and uh, very, very exciting to get involved in it. So yeah. So on that um, optimistic note, I'd say we can uh, wrap it up. Professor, I really appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for doing this. This was Thank awesome. You. This was a blast. <laughs> Thank you. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you.